All right, well, we're in Proverbs 6, and uh, let me see here. Proverbs 6, and starting in verse 16, notice it said, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination uh, unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. If you really consider those seven things, they kind of overlap a little bit. You know, some of them you would do one of those things because of the other. You would lie because you're wanting to shed blood. You know, you would you would uh, want to discord, uh, sow discord among your brother. These things kind of overlap a little bit, which makes sense because all sin pretty much stems from the same place, right? It's uh, either pride, it's almost always related to pride, and, uh, and just a, a kind of a self-love. If you really break down all sin, it's loving yourself more than God or others. And so this is something that we see specifically the lying tongue is what uh, one of the things that God hates. Now... This is one of the messages I, I felt like it was getting too long, so I cut it and I said, we're going to do this in two parts. I'm going to preach part one right now and Lord willing, next Sunday, part two. <clears throat> but I want to look at some things about this, uh, this pa passage or this, this topic, I should say, of a lying tongue that we can, we can gain. And so let me just say a couple things. For starters, uh, this was the topic that I remember. This is the, the topic I remember that brought me to uh, getting saved, actually. So as a, as a kid, maybe seven years old, I began realizing that sin was a you know transgression of the law, and I didn't understand it all, but I knew I broke God's commandments and, and everything, and I knew even a lie was a sin. Now, I didn't know Revelation 21, 8. Let's go there. Most of you have it memorized probably, but for those that don't, let's go ahead and look at it. I didn't know this first. I don't know that anybody had quoted it to me, uh, but this is a list of things that will not be in heaven. And thankfully our flesh, which is full of some of these things, will be put to death <laughs> before our soul goes to heaven. But here's things you won't find in heaven. The fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers and idolaters. And it says, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And I remember as a kid being scared. Like I said, I don't know that anybody ever read that verse to me, but being scared because I knew I had told lies. Now, seven years old, probably hadn't committed a whole lot of terrible sins. I probably felt like I had, you know, because every sin, you know, that gives you a little bit of a, a guilty conscience. Uh, but I remember the lying specifically. I remember one time telling a lie and then telling my family members, I, I'm going to go to hell now. And what are you talking about? Well, I told a lie. And they're thinking, you know, hey, there are people who do a lot worse than that. You're not going to go to hell just because you told a lie. Actually, according to the Bible, if that's the only thing I ever did wrong in my entire life, told a lie, that would be enough to send me to hell without Christ. And so uh, somehow I knew that inside. And I didn't understand it completely, but I knew it inside. And so when I, and I didn't know, how do I know if I'm ever going to be good enough to, to pay for that? How, how does that work? And when somebody showed me the plan of salvation, I was about closer to eight years old around that time, I think, and it just clicked. I didn't know why, but I was like, you know, I'm guilty before God and I need uh, to be forgiven of that. And only through Jesus Christ uh, could you be forgiven. And, and uh, little bitty kid, and I understood that. I understood that. But I remember lying was the thing that brought, brought that to me. And I hated lying. Now, I was guilty of it because we all lie, right? but I hated it. And I have, a, had a, I have a, a, a traumatic experience, okay? I remember being in school, and this little girl made straight A's, super quiet. I got in trouble for talking. She never got in trouble. <clears throat> and just little prissy, you know, girl. And one time, out of the blue, she tells the teacher that I stole her dollar. And I didn't steal her dollar. My mom's whispering back there because she remembers the story. And I said, no, my mom gave me this dollar. I said, here's the little marking on it. Yeah, I remember that. That's my marking. Well, who do you think the teacher believed? Not me. But I'm, I'm still bitter about that. <laughs> but didn't it make you feel bad to know someone lied to you? And you're just like, no, I know that I know what the truth is. And this person, I don't care how innocent she looks, she lied. 
<laughs> that's a traumatic experience. Can you tell I'm still bitter? <laughs> and it, uh, it sticks with you, right? It's a, uh, and so as a kid, even, uh, you know, most of my life, the lying has been that thing that just stands out as like, man, that's a, that's a terrible thing. Now tonight in Iola, I'm preaching on <clears throat> small sins or, you know, you think about a small sin and, uh, a little white lie. Some people talk about that or, or, uh, you know, I'll, I'll preach that tonight. I'm not going to preach it here. Uh, but small sins, what we would call small sins. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit. And some people think of lying as that, but there are different reasons, uh, that people will tell lies and, you know, there's, uh, we're going to talk about some of those. I'll just get into a few things, uh, this afternoon. So number one, let me give you the first point. Some people lie because it actually becomes a habit. It probably we've all met people like that, habitual liars, just for no reason. I remember this girl we used to pick up on the uh, uh, in the van in Iola for the bus ministry, uh, children's ministry, and I got to the point it was so bad. I mean, I literally did not believe a word that came out of this girl's mouth, and it was just so obvious that she was lying, and you'd look at her like, oh, yeah, try to catch her in a lie, you know what I mean? You'd be like, oh, yeah, well, what about this? <laughs> what about that? But it was just so frustrating because how did how did she ever get to this point? I don't know, but she she would just tell lies just to tell them. There was no reason it didn't benefit anybody, but she would just tell a lie. And and sometimes uh, sometimes people are like this. And looking at our text right there, when it says lying tongue, I think you know that's kind of the idea. Just somebody who habitually lies. I think I mean because there's bearing false witness and all that can be included in these in these verses. But uh, somebody who just habitually lies, uh, I would say naturally it's in all of us to lie from time to time for different reasons, which we'll get into in the uh, start to get into in this lesson. From time to time, we all have a tendency and the natural man. That's one of the things that it has a, a bent to do. Just all manners of wickedness we're capable of doing, but just covering things up or being dishonest, hiding, uh, hiding the truth from people for whatever reasons. Uh, this is something that we are all are prone to do. And one of the things about people who just habitually lie, maybe it started out not that way, but they got more and more comfortable with telling lies. And, uh, and it gets to the point where the people actually start believing their own lies. And if you think about it, they kind of have to believe their own lie. Otherwise, they got to constantly be thinking up, oh, what did I tell this person? What did I do that? So they actually become experts at it and they begin believing their own lies to keep them out of getting caught, you know, that they told a lie. And you, like, I'm sure everybody here has met people like that. And what a sad place to be. That seems almost like the, you know, the epitome of, of what I'm talking about, somebody with a lying tongue. And uh, uh, by the way, <laughs> I hate to say this, but preachers fall into this category sometimes. <laughs> you ever heard the preacher tale? That's what they call that. That's a preacher tale. That's what my wife always says. That's a preacher tale. What they mean is, the preacher took the liberty to embellish a little bit. <laughs> I remember in a uh, practice preaching and in, in Bible college, uh, this guy got up there. I still remember his name. Uh, I'm not going to say it though, <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, nobody in here knows him, but still. And, uh, and he got up to preach and he preached a great message. And one of the illustrations he used was about this Olympian athlete. And who I think he was a runner, if I remember, and he started telling all about his background and how he was raised and all these stories in his life and everything. And at the end of the preaching, uh, Brother Sam Davison got up there. He was the, the teacher at the time, and he said, I never heard about that guy. What was Who was that? And he said, I don't know. I made it up. <laughs> and Brother Davison was like, that's probably not a good idea when you're preaching just to make up stories and lie to people. <laughs> <laughs> he just made up a story. It fit well with the message. And, you know, it might not sound like that big of a deal, but look, this is a, this is a dangerous game to play where you just start telling up stories, making things up. Like, hey, this, you know, uh, let me just, uh, I know that's not what the scripture means, but let me twist it a little bit so I can make it fit my point. That'd be a terrible thing, to, a terrible way to treat uh, the word of God. But sometimes that can happen and we want to make sure uh, that we don't get fall into that. <clears throat> but regardless of why a person would become a habitual liar or, or, or just, you know, get caught telling any kind of lies, you're probably going to fall into some of these other categories. And I'm going to just give uh, two of them right now. 
Uh, I'll just tell, tell you this. One thing uh, people will lie because they want to get out of trouble. We'll talk about that. They want to lie just to make themselves look good for whatever reason. Pride, you know. Uh, and then we won't. next week we'll talk about lying for personal gain uh, and then lying to get somebody else in trouble, which is a, ter- a r- very wicked thing to do, like telling somebody stole your dollar bill when they didn't. <laughs> so let's talk about lying to get out of trouble. Look at Genesis chapter 4, verse 9. Genesis chapter 4, verse 9 says, And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? (laughs) That's that's just a bold-faced lie. How are you going to lie to God? But you know what's funny? Some people do that. (laughs) They try to lie to God. I didn't do it. It was like that when I got here. Just like a little kid in the cookie jar, you know, crumbs all over his face. I was like, I didn't do it, <laughs> you know. And right away, I mean, you know, the first children, <laughs> Adam and Eve's offspring, and uh, and Cain is caught in a in a terrible lie. Why? Because he doesn't want to get in trouble. Often, though, the person now, if you're lying to God, he's always going to know. That's dumb. That's a dumb idea. But, you know, oftentimes the person that you're lying to knows that you're lying. <laughs> Some, uh, oftentimes that's the case. They just don't want to just flat out call you a liar, but they know that you're lying. And, uh, and really, if you're going to go that way, it just makes it harder for them to trust you. Just living a lie, telling lies, trying to cover up lies, just always trying to back that lie up with another lie or whatever. And the people know it. They suspect it, but they don't want to, uh, uh, you know, just make a big deal about it. But they're going to have a hard time. Trusting you, if that's the case, look at Genesis chapter 12. Now, I definitely don't think that Abraham was a wicked guy or that he was a, a habitual liar any more than, uh, than any of us would naturally do. But there is a story t- two times where he pretty much does the same thing. Genesis 12, verse 10. And there was a famine in the land. And Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. And it came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt, and he said unto Sarai, his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Oh, wasn't that nice of him? He just told his wife how how beautiful she is. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. Okay, not such a nice guy. Women, how would you like that? Your husband lies. Oh, just tell me you're my sister so that they'll take you, but they'll leave me, (laughs) they'll save me. And the thing is, it doesn't go so well for him. And anytime you try to do that, trying to get yourself out of trouble and you tell a lie, thinking, hey, this is going to make it easier on me. Trust me, it's not. And unfortunately, Abraham doesn't learn his lesson because he does it again. Chapter 20. Chapter 20, And Abraham sojourned from thence toward the south country, and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur, and sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarai his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. Uh, But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night, and said unto him, Behold, thou art but a dead man, for the woman which thou hast taken... Uh, uh, for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a, a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also the righteous, uh, a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, she is my sister? And she even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my, innocency of my hands have I done this. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I not uh, thee not to touch her. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that, uh, all that thou art thine. And so obviously the guy goes to, Abimelech goes to Abraham and says, says, what are you doing? 
why'd you tell me this lie, you know? And I think it's interesting in verse 12, he says this, well, yet indeed she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father. You know what that's called? A half lie. <laughs> Guess what a half lie is? It's still a lie. <laughs> People would do that all the time, though. Well, I didn't really lie. I don't remember what the situation was, but jokingly in our house, we were just uh, discussing this idea. And they were like, well, I didn't really tell a lie. And it's like, well, yeah, half-truth is a lie. <laughs> You're using that to deceive somebody. And a lot of times we do that thinking it's going to make it a little bit easier, not so bad, God won't really mind. But a lie is a lie. And if God said in His Word that he hates a lying tongue. We don't want to have a lying tongue. We want to be as honest as we can. Again, we all fall short. I know we're all sinners and in the flesh we'll be prone to do, uh, do things, but we need to get it in our mind that this is a wicked thing, just like any, any sin. And, uh, and it's always going to get us into trouble, and it's not going to get us out of trouble like we think it is. Uh, and I, I remember a time in my life early on, I don't want to get into the details because I hate even talking about it. And I don't like bringing it up to my wife, but there was something that I was struggling with. And uh, I remember thinking my wife is going to someday find out my sin. And I said, I don't want her to find out my sin. Then she's never going to trust me. So I got an option here. You know, I just go to her and I tell her what happened and hope that she'll forgive me or you know, whatever. And so obviously that's the way I went. And I've to this day thought how much uh, that was hard, still hard, but how much easier that was than had she just found out and I had been hiding stuff or whatever, you know, and uh, uh, that's a terrible thing, but we dig ourselves in the holes. Why? Because we're afraid, afraid to get in trouble. Well, what we really need to do is fear God because God's going to make sure that you're, you're found out, <laughs> right? So you need to live righteous before God and, uh, and clean, holy hands. David is a great example of that. Messed up all the time, but then he'd come clean, bear the humiliation, and, uh, and, and, and just get that right before God. All right, but that's something that people do lying to get out of trouble. Let's look at some more examples. Uh, oh, here, here, the next thing. So this is Abraham. Two times he lies in this manner, right? Well, guess what his son Isaac does? Exact same thing. Guess what? Your kids are going to pick up your habits. They're going to pick up the things that you do. And uh, this Isaac does the same thing. Look at Genesis 26. I don't know if he heard the story or how he knew to do this or what, but it's the same thing his father did. In verse 6, it says, Isaac dwelt in Gerar, and the men of the place asked him of his wife, and he said, She is my sister, for he feared to say, She is my wife. Lest said he, uh, the men of this place should kill me for Rebecca because she was fair to look on. Exact same thing that his dad did. Natural tendency. And you know, sometimes we want to pass down to our kids, hey, don't ever do this. I made mistakes. They didn't work out so well for me. And sometimes the kids are just going to keep on doing the same things that the, uh, that the parents did. Uh, you got you, you to gotta make sure that you're going to stop with the idea, of, I don't want to get in trouble, so I'm going to be dishonest. Now, look at Joshua 2. This is a difficult one because of the fact that later on in the book of James, what I'm about to read is kind of considered to be a good thing. Joshua chapter 2, the story of, uh, of Rahab. Oh, that's Mark. <laughs> I had my Bible marked and I forgot. Okay, chapter 2, verse, uh, let's read the first seven verses. And Joshua the son of Nun sent out to Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go, view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into an harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they are come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them and said thus, There came men unto me, but I wist not whence they were. And it came to pass about the time of the shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out. Whither the men went, I want not. Pursue after them quickly, for ye shall overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof of the house and hid them with the stalks of the flax, which she had laid in order upon the roof. And the men pursued after them 
the way to Jordan unto the fords. And as soon as they uh, which pursued after them were gone, they shut the gate. And before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you, to, uh, given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you uh, when he came out of Egypt. And what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. Now, anyway, I, I could keep reading, but you understand that gist of the story. She hides the spies, and then she lies and says that they're gone and everything. You might look at that and say, well, that's not a big deal. In fact, you might look at that and say, well, what she did was the best possible thing that she could do. And in fact, James says, hey, Rahab the harlot, you know, she did uh, this great thing. But wait a minute, it's a lie, <laughs> you know. And so you say, well, who cares what she did? I mean, we're talking about somebody who had not yet fully, you know, even become a believer. She just knew that, hey, I need to, you know, God's working among these people or whatever. But don't ever get in this situation where you try to think, well, I'm going to tell this lie so that good may come. <laughs> I'm going to tell this lie because that's going to help me out. God's never going to bless that. And, uh, I mean, you might get away with it. It might seem like something that he just kind of winked his eye at. No, no big deal. But we know what his heart is. We know that he wants us to be honest and not to be hiding these kinds of things. And so we want to be uh, as open and honest as we can. One more. First, uh, uh, First Samuel 19. Very similar idea. First Samuel, did I say 19? <clears throat> okay, look at verse 11. Saul also sent messengers unto David's house to watch him and to slay him in the house. Uh, I'm sorry, to slay him in the morning. And Michal, David's wife, told him, saying, If thou save not thy life tonight, tomorrow thou shalt be slain. So Michal let David down through a window. And he went and fled and escaped. And Michal took an image and laid it in the bed and put a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster and covered it with a cloth. And when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, He is sick. And Saul sent the messengers again to see David, saying, Bring him up to me in the bed that I may slay him. And when the messengers were come in, behold, there was an image in the bed with the pillow of goat's hair for his bolster. And Saul said unto Michal, why hast thou deceived me so, and sent, me, uh, sent away mine enemies, that he has escaped? And Michal answered Saul, He said unto me, Let me go. Why should I kill thee? So she's not only lying and saying, Oh, no, no, he, you know, he's sick. He's in bed right here, whenever she was obviously covering up. But then later on, when asked why she does that, she says, Well, he was going to kill me. Now, I don't know. You could, again, you could justify and say, well, what else was she going to do? I mean, you know, somebody comes in you, and you know that your life's at stake or something like that. Your tendency is going to be to lie. I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to say <laughs> that I wouldn't be tempted or maybe do the same thing in certain situations. I'm just saying that doesn't make it right. And honestly, I don't know 100% what would have happened had she told the truth or, you know, did something a little bit differently. But I do know this, that she ends up getting being given to another man, Faltiel. And it's possible her dad said, well, I mean, he was going to kill her anyway. Maybe she kind of brought that on herself. I don't know. I'm just saying you could read into all things. You don't know how things would have went. But if we love God and we trust God, even when confronted with a hard situation where it's super hard to tell the truth and we don't want to tell the truth because it's going to get us into trouble, tell the truth, right? It's, it's right. You'll be right before God. Your hands will be clean and uh, he'll bless you for that. All right. So lying because it's a habit, lying to get out of trouble. Number three, lying to make yourself look good. This is really, uh, this is a common thing that we find ourselves doing. <clears throat> we live in an age. <laughs> I'm just thinking about social media. We live in an age where everybody, don't look, believe those profile pics. They're all lies. <laughs> We want to look good. We don't. Want, we want to hide uh, and cover up imperfections and, and impurities, and we want to look good. It makes sense. But look back in our text. Well, you don't have to look there. But back in our text, what did it say? These seven things that the Lord hate, or six things that the Lord hate, 
Yeah, he's seven. Uh, maybe we, <laughs> we ought to look at it. But when he says a proud look and a lying tongue, a proud look, God does not like pride. You know, and pride, of course, is the motivation behind all the sins that we do. Uh, but when somebody is just concerned about making themselves look good all the time, and I already talked about the, the preachers who embellish the stories and, and tell lies, make, th make themselves look bigger than they did. Uh, I was just reading recently, I don't want to get into this, but uh, reading about uh, uh, who's that uh, apologist that died and then all this stuff came out, right? Robbie Zacharias. And I heard that one of the things I did I didn't know that apparently he wasn't a doctor, but he calls himself doctor, <laughs> right? and he hadn't been to all these schools and places that he had claimed that he had been to. And uh, man, there was a lot of stuff just kind of unearthed about this guy. And one of the things was just trying to make himself look good and to be more than he was. And and I, and I, I know there are honorary degrees that are given and everything. I don't know the whole story behind it, but uh, but man, how easy that is to do that. Want to have all these titles before your name and and uh, be called something and look a certain part when look you're just a regular guy like everybody else <laughs> quit pretending and trying to make yourself look so so uh uh good because what it always does first of all again everybody sees right through it they know who you are they know that you know something's not right most of the time and you trying to do that is just making yourself look worse and worse, okay? But not only that, God's the one who knows all things, and He sees that, and He'll be upside, uh, upset about it. Look at 1 Samuel 31. Give you an example on that. First Samuel 31. Look at verse 3. And the battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him, and he was sore wounded of the archers. Then said Saul unto his armor bearers, Draw thy sword, and thrust me through therewith, lest the uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. I mean, that really makes sense in the time, in the culture, considering what they're doing. He's like, if I don't die from this wound, you know, they're going to come and they're going to they're going to make it way much worse than if I just died. So he's telling the guy, just, you know, just kill me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. Therefore, Saul took a sword and fell on it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise upon his sword and died with him. And Saul died and his three sons. Uh, so Saul died and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men that same day. Now look at 2 Samuel. Chapter 1. Now it came to pass after the death of Saul, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, that David had abode two days in Ziklag. It came even to pass on the third day that, behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes rent and earth upon his head, and so it was when he came to David that he fell to the earth and did obeisance. And David said unto him, From whence comest thou? And he said unto him, Out of the camp of Israel am I escaped. And David said unto him, How went the matter? I pray thee, tell me. And he answered, That the people are fled from the battle, and many of the people also are fallen and dead, and Saul and Jonathan his son are dead also. And David said unto the young man that told him, how knowest thou that Saul and Jonathan, his son, be dead? And the young man that told him said, As I happened by chance unto Mount Gilboa, behold, Saul leaned upon his spear, and lo, the chariots and the horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me and called unto me, and I answered, Here am I. And he said unto me, Who art thou? And I answered him, I am an Amalekite. And he said unto me again, Stand, I pray thee, upon me, and slay me, for anguish has come upon me, because my life is yet whole in me. So I stood upon him and slew him, because I was sure that he would not live after that he was fallen. And I took the crown that was upon his head, and the bracelet that was on his arm, and have brought them hither unto my Lord. Now that sounds maybe like a noble thing. This guy's, uh, you know, thinking, hey, I'm just going, he's an Amalekite, by the way. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to show David that I'm loyal to him. And I'm going to go and I'm going to bring him this. I'm going to tell him that, hey, he died. And I want you to have this. And, and maybe trying to say, you know, save some face. 
with David. And so he comes and he tells all this story, but look how it ended up for him. David told, uh, uh, took hold of his clothes and rent them, and likewise all the men that were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until even for Saul and for Jonathan his son, and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel, because they were fallen by the sword. And David said unto the young man that told him, Whence art thou? And he answered, I am the son of a stranger and a Malachite. And David said unto him, How wast thou not afraid to stretch forth thine hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? And David called one of the young men and said, Go near and fall upon him. And he smote him and he died. And David said unto him, Thy blood be upon thy head, for thy mouth has testified against thee, saying, I have slain the Lord's anointed. Now, if you didn't follow what happened, what we read in 1 Samuel was that Saul fell on his own sword and he died, right? Because he didn't want somebody else to kill him. And it says they were all dead. All of his men were dead. And then when you get to 2 Samuel, same author, okay? But he's writing the testimony of this guy that came to David. And David's, and he's saying, oh, yeah, I found him. And he wasn't dead yet. And so he asked me uh, to kill him. For whatever reason, he thought that this was a good thing to tell David. <laughs> he wanted to somehow make himself look good before David. And he was lying the whole time. He had to have been. There's no other reason uh, that he would have said all that knowing that the narrative told us what really happened. But he's lying. He's, he thinks that it's going to help him some. And look how it ended up for him. Not so good. <laughs> he ended up being, being killed. And we got to be careful that we uh, don't ever get to this point where we want to make ourselves look good and we begin telling lies. Guess what? Your sin's going to find you out. It's going to be unveiled eventually. <laughs> you know. And if not, God knows and he's going to deal with it. Sometimes there's really no reason to tell a lie at all. Why? What did this guy think he was going to accomplish? What was his reason for doing this? And sometimes we do that and we don't really even have a reason to do it, but we want to make ourselves look good and we'll be like, you know, listening to a story and be like, oh, yeah, 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 I saw that, you know. Oh, yeah, 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 I did that too, you know. Uh, you see young, uh, young kids do this a lot. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know that. And they want to make themselves look good and you're like, you don't know that. You've never been there. <laughs> you know, it's just common. You see it all the time and you're like, no, don't, don't grow up to be a liar. <laughs> right? It's not going to help you. It's always going to go bad. Here's what you need to do. You need to realize that lies hurt people, that God isn't happy with it. He hates lying. And you need to humble yourself and say, look, I'm not going to just try to get myself out of trouble. I'm going to let God deal with it. He can get me out of trouble. I'm going to throw myself at his mercy. And you need to humble yourself and uh, even be willing to confess your faults to other people and, uh, and, and leave it in God's hands because he's the one that can take care of it. So next week we'll talk about lying for personal gain and, uh, and lying to get somebody else in trouble, which has got a serious punishment attached to that in the Bible. Let's pray. Father, I pray you help us to be honest men and women in this room and that we would live our, our life with the desire to please you and uh, be most effective for the work you've called us to do. And we know that you'd never have us to be dishonest and, and, uh, and telling lies. So, so Lord, help us to forever live with that understanding that we need to be trustworthy people and honest people. And I pray you just help our, our words be true, our yeas be yea and our nays be nay, and, uh, and that you could use us in a mighty way for that that we, our, our walk wouldn't be hindered. I pray you bless this congregation. Thank you for all those here today, and I pray that you be uh, glorified this afternoon. Uh, be with them as they go soul winning. Give them boldness and uh, uh, protection. Give them wisdom as they go uh, to different doors. And Lord willing, we'll see people saved today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.